Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our latest Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center webinar that covers the modernization of personal protective equipment for hazmat, zebra, and first responders. My name is Steve Rutherford, and I'm the lead for the HDI Act, and today we have the privilege of again hosting Dr. Christina Baxter for this presentation. I want to express my appreciation to all of you for taking time out to join us today for this exciting and very relevant topic. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center. The DTEC IAC mission is to collect, synthesize, produce, and disseminate scientific and technical information. So if you haven't checked out DTIC's website, you can find it at www.discoverdtic.mil, and I encourage you to take a look at their myriad offerings. Without DTIC sponsorship, this webinar series would not be possible. A few admin notes as we start out as usual. Please note that all the attendee lines have been muted, so if you've got a question during the webinar, we're going to ask you to submit it using the attendee chat box that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. We're going to work to save the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation to go over those questions and discuss them. Please also note that the webinar is being recorded, and you're going to find a link for the recording as well as the slides that will be available at the HDI website for later download for registered members. So with that admin stuff out of the way, it's going to be my pleasure now to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Christina Baxter. Dr. Baxter is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Hazard 3 Tips, and she's a senior leader with over 25 years of experience in the chem, bio, rad, nuke, and high-yield explosive community. She's well-known in the community, and I can tell you personally that I gained familiarity with her work during my time as the commanding officer of the Marine Corps Chem Bio Incident Response Force. Christina has served the public throughout her career. She was the manager of the Ciberni program at the DOD Combating Terrorism Technical Support Office. In that job, she was responsible for managing domestic and international Ciberni research and development programs to combat terrorism, as well as overseeing international Ciberni agreements with Australia, Canada, Israel, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. She currently, currently utilizes her experience to produce training courses, develop exercises, and provide solutions for emergency response through the development of next generation tools to enhance situational awareness and responder safety. Christina is currently the chairperson for the National Fire Protection Association Hazardous Materials Protective Clothing and Equipment Technical Committee and is a member of the NFPA Fire Service and Occupational Safety Technical Committee and the NFPA Hazardous Materials Response Personal, Personnel Technical Committee. I, li I highlight just these few things among her many other selfless contributions. Dr. Baxter received dual undergraduate degrees in both chemistry and environmental science from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and she completed her doctoral studies in analytical chemistry at the Georgia Institute of Technology. It is our distinct honor and privilege to host her today, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Steve. It's an honor to be here uh, with you guys again at the HDIX. As you know, I'm a firm believer in the DOD mission set as well as the DTIC and the AIX. So it is really great for me to have the chance to be here with you. But what we're going to talk about today is the modernization of the HAZMAT CBRN PPE. And one of the things that's really interesting to note is how DOD has been involved throughout this entire process in really getting us to this next generation of PPE that we see today. So I want to walk you through kind of the genesis behind that, the way that we've modernized, where we started, where we are today, and then some of the different areas that we have to focus in on when we try to modernize our PPE. And it's really important that we look at that because what we've spent most of our time on the last 10 years is making sure that everything that we design is fit for function. So instead of focusing on design characteristics that we want, we've been focusing very much on performance characteristics. So I'm going to walk you through the different performance characteristics that we have, the endpoints that we use, and why we chose them for operational relevance, and then go from there. But that's kind of the genesis of the project today. So if we start going back to where we started from, for some of us old timers on here, we all remember those early suits that were quite heavy, almost like a thick rubber material. And then we started moving more towards the Teflons, which were much thinner, but still a bit more rigid than what we see today. Then we had multi-layer suits where we actually, instead of having them compared, all merged into a sandwich of uh, layers, 
they were actually literally multiple layers. You put on one suit and then you got in another to get the levels of protection you needed. Fast forward to today, we still have a lot of these, what people used to call moon suits or the suits that were very much like a uh, space suit looking. And we still have those for certain mission sets. But as we go forward, we also have new gear that provides us with that protection, but is much more rugged, much more form fitting. It allows us to get the um, capabilities we need in a form fit function that works for us. So the first step we had to do was to look at the realities of the chemical exposures that we came across. And so as we went back and studied all the different incidents that we respond to, we said the majority of all of our exposures were very short term in terms of minutes to hours versus days, and we're at very low concentrations. So we weren't generally falling into a vat of chemical that was 100% pure, like we challenged them. It was more about that 10,000 parts per million and below. And we monitor extensively today. We have technologies in the detection space now that allow us to quickly and efficiently monitor the space we're working in to make really good real-time decisions on what type of protection we need. Now, if we go back and look at the accidents that have occurred and the issues that have happened in the hazmat community where injuries resulted, most of those, if not all of those accidents were from a loss of functionality versus a chemical exposure. It's very rare that we actually get a, a chemical exposure. Most of the incidents that actually resulted in exposure were actually an explosion incident versus an actual dermal toxicity threat. So our greatest exposure concern in all of these ensembles, because frankly, every manufacturer that we work with in the United States today makes fantastic materials. It's the ensemble integrity that we worry about. It's taking that material and making it into an ensemble and focusing in on the seams, interfaces, and zippers where we're most likely to get penetration of the materials. Permeation-wise, which is at the molecular level, we have fantastic materials to choose from. So when we start selecting PPE, we have to look at it across that spectrum of threats. What operational environment are we look at working in? That's gonna tell us a lot about how rugged does the material have to be? What's the toxicity of the material we're dealing with? And what about its flammability? So the task that we're doing, its location, and the time period in which we have to accomplish it are all key considerations. So if we want to go back to when did we start with chemical PPE standards, it all started in August of 1983. And that was the incident in Venecia, California, where a tank car was loaded with dimethylamine. The responders did exactly what they were taught, and they looked at the chemicals and said, are these materials uh, compat compatible with the chemicals that we're going to be dealing with? The reality of the situation was the chemical compatibility charts told them these suits are compatible and therefore they went downrange with them on and worked directly with the threat material. The reality was almost all of our charts that we look at are very specific to the base garment material and not the interfaces, seams, visors, and interfaces. So we have to be really careful about that because in this case, the leaks came about because the face pieces were not compatible with the chemical but the table only talked about the base garment material, which was very compatible. So in the, in the end, we had responders who received dermal uh, exposures inside what was supposed to be a vapor tight suit. And that was followed up by NTSB doing an evaluation, National Transportation Safety Board, where they did an evaluation of the incident and suggested that performance-based standards be developed in place of those design-based considerations, which were the level A, B, C, but actually have performance characteristics to stand up to. And that was the beginning of the NFPA standards for chemical protective clothing. So if we look back to the requirements that OSHA had put forward, all it says is um, design characteristics. It must maintain, you know, it must have uh, fully encapsulating. It must use an SCBA. It doesn't get until the appendix where it says it must maintain positive pressure and prevent inward leakage and provide examples of how you test that. 
And those things in the appendix are very much uh, non-required, non-regulatory language. So the regulatory language only says a design that it must be fully encapsulating. And so what we are trying to do was go forward and define what was meant for each level of protection. So why do we use the NFPA standards? Because OSHA went back and added in, again, non-regulatory language, appendix language, and said they recommend that you procure suits that meet the chemical protective standards. From a DOD perspective in the US, in 2006, we started moving towards using NFPA uh, approved or certified ensembles for DOD CBRN elements because it made good sense and we had evaluated the standards and said, you know what, these are gonna meet our needs and we may have used those as a minimum standard and add in some very specific tests for other threats. Now, the future of what we'll see, if you're used to the standards being NFPA 1991, 1992, and 1994, all of those are being merged this year into what will be called NFPA 1990. And that standard um, will be a combination standard. It'll have all three of them in there. You'll still see products that are certified against each, but all of the documents will be together. And we actually wove each of these documents, instead of having chapters one through eight being NFPA 1991, nine through 16 being 1992, et cetera, we actually went ahead and merged them at each chapter level. Because what that allowed us to do was to show you the natural progression of protection as it went from one standard to the next. In addition, we came out with NFPA 1891. That's the Selection Care and Maintenance Document, or SCAM document, we call them for short, which allows you and walks you through how do you take care of all this gear? How do you inspect it? When do you take it out of service? What are the things that you should be replacing and shouldn't be replacing in the field? And providing just more and more information. And we also beefed up the annex sections for all of these documents to try to sell, tell the user this is exactly why we choose this endpoint and what does it mean operationally. So as you go forward, these documents should be out in the late fall of this uh, of 2021. The documents have already been through their whole public process and have been approved for release. And now we just wait until the end of the year when they go out. They usually will have a 2022 ad, uh, date on them. But when we start looking at this, the 1994 standard, which was first published in the year 2000, was about designing for the first time ensembles that were specific to the type of work we do as emergency response and defense elements. And what we were looking for were ensembles that had a higher level of ruggedness that if you all remember back to our trainings where we said, hey, if you put your knee down on the ground, you automatically fail on all of your different tests because you're gonna destroy the gear. Well, reality is with the 1994 certified gear, we're actually testing gear for the environment in which we work. We're looking at things that allow us to climb up and down stairs and, and ladders faster. We're looking for things that will allow us to move in areas where there may be um, things that could tear or puncture our gear. And we need to make sure that they're not gonna affect us. So each one of these things is something that was brought in. And in 2018 edition, we also incorporated all of the National Institute of Justice uh, requirements that they have put together for law enforcement personnel. So think of it in terms of clan lab uh, response. All of that was then incorporated into the 1994 standard. So the one that comes out in the near term for 2022 that will actually release and hit the streets in um, probably October, November of 2021, that will incorporate not only the requirements for hazmat response, the requirements for DOD CBRN response, but also the law enforcement response um, and all of this will be merged together into one document to make it much easier from a standards perspective as well as from an operational perspective. Trying to see where my next slide section went. Okay. 
Can you hear me on HDIF? I'm going to try to reload. Sorry, it went to mute him again. Um, I'll start back again on this one. Uh, the NFPA standards, if you look at them in comparison to the EPA levels, the NFPA standards, remember, those are performance-based where the EPA levels are design-based. So if we look at NFPA 1991, that's our traditional level A, fully encapsulating vapor tight ensemble. And then we look at 1994 class one, which is our non-encapsulating, it's a fully encapsulating of the wearer, but not of the SCBA, that is also meant to meet OSHA EPA class uh, level A. If we go to what we expect to be a level B, we end up with the 1994 class two or a 1992 suit. That 1992 suit was meant to be for liquid splash protection, whereas the 1994 combines liquid splash protection with a moderate level of vapor protection. So it's a little bit more than you'd get from a traditional level B. And then if we go down further, our class three and our class four become a level C. And that's because they use an APR or an SC or not an APR or a PAPR versus an SCBA. So it's the respiratory protection, which is dictating it towards a C. Now, when we start testing these, we start looking across and say, well, wait a minute. These NFPA ones are tested against liquids and vapors, and in some cases, particulates and viruses. So there's a little bit more testing that goes on here to ensure that if we have a vapor forming liquid or if we have um, different levels of uh, vapors that we actually are protecting against them. Now, another way to look at this is, again, from the design specifications, we look at the 1991 uh, and the 1994 class one, still the only two that meet EPA uh, or OSHA level A. But as we get down further, we start looking at if any of the others, if you're wearing an SCBA, that brings you to a B. If you're wearing an APR or PAPR, it brings you to a C. So the same garment, when worn with different respiratory protection, goes from a B to a C if you lower your respiratory protection. So just looking at, because everybody always asks, how do they line up? Well, they don't line up perfectly, but this is the best way to compare them across the board. Now, as we start looking at the different characteristics, the first and most important that we always deal with, and what most people are most comfortable with, is the material barrier performance. In this case, it's looking at the material at a material level, not as a garment ensemble level, but just looking at swatches of material and saying, how do they perform? So in this case, we're usually looking at degradation. Does the material change in some way when it's in contact? Does it shrink away? Does it do anything uh, strange? Penetration, does the material get through interfaces, seams, and openings? or permeation, does the chemical get through at a molecular level? And so when we look at these, permeation um, is one that creates the most confusion. And a lot of that is based upon the ways in which data is represented, because there are multiple ways that you see permeation data. You often see tables that just have a breakthrough time or most commonly a normalized breakthrough time. You may see something that's the rate of permeation. How fast does it go through? And then for the NFPA standards, you see what's called cumulative permeation. How much material gets through during that time period? And what we're looking for there is how can we compare that back to a dose? So one of the things that we're 
trying to get out to people this year. And it's something that will be included in the next generation of NFPA 472 and 1072, or which were both being combined into what's going to be called NFPA 470, but it's the hazmat operations standards. And one of the things that you'll be required to do if you follow those is to define the limitations of chemical compatibility charts. And the reality here is chemical compatibility charts are fantastic pieces of information, but they can't be the only piece of information you use to select a garment or ensemble because it's really a combination of the clothing design, its integrity, meaning how does it work as a system and the materials, uh, chemical resistance that all come together to produce one uh, answer because chemicals will always take that path of least resistance. So it's gonna be about design characteristics and the integrity of the suit are the most important pieces because we know that almost every manufacturer out there makes really strong uh, materials today. So how do we measure permeation? Well, this is a pretty standard setup. So let, I'll give you two examples here. We have a chamber of a cell where one side we put in the test chemical. We put the test chemical in as a pure material. And then on the other side of the material specimen, we have either air or water. So let's say it was ammonia as our challenge chemical. We're going to put our pure ammonia as high as we can concentration into one side. And we're going to measure over a period of time to see how much comes through into the air. And we use air as a collection median on this side because we can measure ammonia and air really easily. Now, if I did it with sulfuric acid instead, I could fill this with high purity sulfuric acid. I could put pressure against it, against this material. But unless I put water in here, I don't really have a great way to measure air, sulfuric acid coming through at that low level. So I put water in here because I can measure pH and measure it pretty readily. So it's really about making sure we have a medium in which to test it. And again, remember, these are standard materials level tests. When I look at the chemical permeation data, I have to look at it from the appropriate perspective. Cumulative permeation, like I said, is all of the area under that curve. So as we measure for a period of time, we want to look at every bit of material that made it through. That's what we do in the NFPA standards. If we're looking at the breakthrough tables, then we're generally looking at what's called normalized or standard breakthrough time. And what often happens is people think they're looking at a table that says greater than 480 minutes. That means I'm not gonna get anything through for at least 480 minutes. Well, that's actually not true. The reality is, the 480 minutes is when you reach the, a standard breakthrough rate of 0.1 micrograms per square centimeter per minute. So you could actually get quite a large amount of material through before you ever reach that normalized breakthrough time. But it's not captured in that way. They're just measuring discrete periods, whereas the cumulative captures everything and measures it as a whole. So one you can apply to dose and one you can't. Normalized breakthrough times are a fantastic way to compare between multiple options of materials if you have a standard chemical prep, but not necessarily the information you want to be able to choose where you go from there. So when we look at these charts, so this is just a standard chart. They're called chemical breakthrough charts, chemical permeability charts, or chemical compatibility charts. When we look at the charts, we have to remember that these are normalized breakthrough times measured against pristine material, not material that's been worn. So the things that we do in the NFPA standard to take into account the wearability is that we apply it to the primary ensemble materials as well as all seams and all interfaces. The materials get abraded and flexed to simulate the repeated use and test durability what we're talking about here is taking low grit sandpaper and rubbing it against the material in a standardized way, and then taking the material and twisting it back and forth and making sure that we flex the material like if we were walking along and we've abraded it like the two pieces of material on our legs are rubbing together. We test it at an elevated temperature and humidity because 
it's the microclimate within the soup that's going to help dictate the permeation cap- compare, uh, the uh, permeation rate. What we're looking at here in most of these tables is that standard room temperature of 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is far lower than what we see in the microclimate. So in the NFPA standards, we actually increase that temperature and humidity to ensure that we take that into context. So permeation also is not uniform. So it's not a straight line that you see. So what we're looking for is making sure we capture all of that information. And the ways that we do it is here's how we flex and abrade it. So abrasion is on the left-hand side, and you can see pristine material held up onto a uh, into position. And then we have a piece of sandpaper that moves around in a circular motion, and the sample gets pushed up against it. And you actually can see on the bottom picture where you started to remove some of that outer layer. You also have pieces of your material that are put on this flex machine that actually has a piston that moves in and out but twists while it's doing it to continually get that flexing. That is the kind of thing that we do in the standards to represent wear and tear of the material and the materials level tested. Now, a question I often get with going to the 1994 type of products is, what about the SCBAs? Because remember, while... The 1991 standard, the traditional level A, is fully encapsulating, encapsulating both the operator and the SCBA, whereas the NFPA 1994 Class 1 level A design encapsulates the wearer only, the SCBA is on the outside, and frankly, the SCBA mask is used as the face shield. Now, when we look at that, they're both fully encapsulating of the user, but the issue we have is what are the potential effects on our SCBA over time? And so DOD, through the Technical Support Working Group, um, did some testing for making sure for DOD's perspective that these SCBAs would stand up to the type of work. The great information is no permeation um, of the chemicals tested. <clears throat> there was no effects on the SCBAs and PAPRs. Reality is you get much more exposure than a standard fire call than you'd ever get during these types of hazmat calls. The one issue that we do worry about still is the liquid splash of a caustic material directly onto next generation SCBA cylinders, such as carbon fiber cylinders. And that's because a high strength liquid exposure up towards that material could start to work against the materials that cover the carbon fiber. So there are SCBA covers you can get that would cover that fiber bottle to make sure that you get that full longevity of the bottle if that's of a concern. Reality is for a lot of people, when you start dealing with caustics that may be splashing up above the waist and stuff, they generally go to a fully encapsulating type of suit of some sort anyway. Now, how do we check and pick these chemical batteries? Obviously we can't test every chemical known to man or suits would be so outrageously expensive that we'd never be able to afford them. But the reality is we don't need to. What we need to test is the chemical of each class that causes the most harm to the material, not to us as operators. What we want is the chemical for each class that's the worst case actor on a material level, which is generally the smallest of the chemicals. And we want to take that information for permeation and penetration and then compare it toxicity-wise to the worst case after to the human. So we have to measure one chemical and infer the other. And that allows us to get a worst case and always be erring on the side of safety. So the ASTM, American Society for Testing Materials International, uh, in 1983 did a study which came up with a list of chemicals to test. And so in 2008, DOD, through the Technical Support Working Group, went ahead and did a new study in 2008 just to go through and make sure we've updated it with anything else that we have uh, coming in. And then in 2011, the Joint Program Protection also funded the Naval Research Laboratory to do uh, an evaluation to ensure, again, that the NFPA standards themselves were also addressing the DOD threats. Throughout those, and there are four different studies within those three different groupings, 
we came up with a list of chemicals that had combinations of selection factors. For instance, likelihood or frequency of exposure, ammonia, chlorine, sulfuric acid. Those are chemicals that were added not because of their toxicity to the human, but because of their high frequency. Expected consequences of exposure. Okay, some of these things could be carcinogens. They could be things that are skin absorbing. So we added in a few of these. Persistency in the environment, okay? Low vapor pressure liquids. Some of our chemical warfare agents get added in here. The potential impact on material performance. We have a lot of chemicals that we know are gonna be the worst case actors for different types of materials. So we wanna get those in there to ensure that we've done our due diligence. And then we have to always think about the ability to analyze um, the material. So can we detect it on the other side? And then availability and safety for testing. Obviously, we want to make sure that we don't put the test labs into danger if it's unnecessary. So when we did this, we went ahead and found our 50 high-priority chemicals via those four methods of evaluation. That broke down to 23 liquids, six gases, and two chemical warfare agents. You'll see things like um, we use Somin instead of Sarin. It's not because Somin's more toxic. It's because Somin's vapor pressure means is lower, and it's going to stay there in place versus the Sarin, which we're going to have some off-gassing, which will mean we don't have as strong of a challenge over the entire life of the test. So when you start testing those, uh, Solman provides a harsher challenge on the material level. Sarin would be a har harsher challenge to the person. If you're interested in this, you can go to my emergency response tips website or the Rethink Level A website, and I've got whole lectures just on those topics, which I know are extremely exciting to so many of us. Not really, but to me they are. So these are the end chemical batteries. And what we're looking at are liquid chemicals, gas chemicals, and then additional chemicals that we pick that are really specific about uh, effects on materials. So we actually go through and say diethylamine, ethyl acetate, these are tetrachloroethylene. These are things that we know are going to have an effect on the different types of materials that we deal with. And this is how we infer it. So we use acrolein to measure because it's the smallest and simplest of the aldehydes, which means it's going to go through as a permeant probably the fastest. And then we can reference all these others from it, which may be something like formaldehyde. It's going to be much worse case after to the human. Now, we also have to test for biological materials. When we do this, we always use um, this Phi X174 bacteriophage, and that's because it's 27 nanometers in size. To do that, we use about, I don't remember how many millions of uh, virus particles per milliliter, but it's a very high level. And we do that intentionally because this bacteriophage, even compared to coronavirus, is half the size. And what we're looking for here is a biological material in a fluid matrix, which is a worst case scenario for getting through seams and interfaces, how much gets through, if any. And frankly, if any gets through, you fail the test. So very uh, detailed on how we do that one. Now, as I said before, ensemble integrity is really where it's at because we have to look at how the design of the suit comes together and making sure that we test it as an ensemble and to make sure that we have things that are gonna work for us. And we have to remember that there's a very big difference when we say something is liquid resistant versus liquid proof, okay? If the PPE materials are liquid proof, but the zipper is only liquid resistant, then you have a compromise of the whole ensemble. Reality is zippers are generally our biggest failing um, and then seams and interfaces. So zippers, unfortunately, there are only a few out there that are really high end to allow us to do things, but we really need to keep them covered so that they don't get challenged too much. Now, gas tight integrity, everybody should be used to this one. That's the standard inflation test. That's just making sure that the suit itself can hold a pressure. And what we're looking for here are tiny pinholes that we can't see with the naked eye. 
Man and simulant test is where we actually put an operator in the ensemble, properly fitted, put them in a chamber with a chemical challenge of methyl salicylate, and we put them doing certain types of experiments and work in 30 minute time period where they have that continuous challenge. And what we're trying to do is get them to move every seam and interface to make sure that if there's a chance of breakthrough, it occurs. While they're wearing this, they, underneath their gear, they actually have 30 different small uh, decimeter pads that are capturing and absorbing the different chemicals that get through. We have them set all over the body at the areas where we're most likely to have some type of breakthrough, and that way we can capture what has occurred. So we have them doing all kinds of twist, crawling, climbing ladders. Then they go through a full decontamination and then they're slowly and carefully pulled out of the suit because we want to make sure that we don't cross contaminate any of those pads. The pads then go directly in for analysis. That is one of the ways that we test to make sure that all of these ensembles meet the design and operational need. So when you start looking at a vapor protection, if we're looking to have an ensemble and we're looking at either a vapor or a uh, vapor producing liquid, then we need one of these types of suits that's going to provide our protection. But we need to know what level we're looking at. So if we're looking at something like a class three, those are only tested at 40 parts per million challenge. Whereas the class two is tested at 350 parts per million, the class one at 10,000 parts per million. And the NFPA 1991 suits are tested at 100% chemical. So as you would expect, you're going to have increasing protection as we go up towards that 1991 suit. But when we get that increase in protection, we also get that increase in heat stress. And at the same time, we decrease our comfort and our tactility. So if I were to give you a challenge of putting nuts and bolts together, I would expect you would finish that challenge in these class two and class three suits in 15 minutes. But in a class one suit, it's going to take a little bit longer to 20 minutes. In an NFP 1991 suit, it's going to take you 30 minutes. And that's just because you're losing visibility, tactility, your hands, your gloves, all of that's going to be much harder to work with. And you're under heat load. Now, when we start looking at the ensembles, we have to remember there are multiple types of ensembles. We have single use. Those are ones you put on, you throw away, okay? Single exposure, those are ones you can wash and reuse unless a significant exposure has occurred. All of those details will be in the manufacturer's documents on how to take care of them. And remember that decon on scene is not the same thing as washing and disinfecting. Decon on scene is reducing the threat, washing is removing it, and disinfecting is making sure that you've done any other biological body fluids to get out of there. And then there's multiple exposure suits. Those are ones that we wash and reuse even after exposed many times. And all of these have their roles and places. Now, when we talk about liquid integrity, it's about making sure that all of the pieces work together mm -hmm. and that if we were to get a liquid splash or if we're going through a liquid decon, we know that we're not going to get material to get pushed underneath or through seams and interfaces. In this case, we use surfactant treated water coming from every direction under pressure and we use the surfactant because that decreases the surface tension of the liquid, making it easier to find its way through seams and interfaces. Same type of thing you would see here would be if you've ever seen sulfuric acid find its way around every zipper, interface, whatever, because sulfuric acid has a low surface tension. And so you have to be really careful when you're working with it to make sure it doesn't find its way around everything. When we look at liquid splash protection, we know that our materials that we have for vapor protection are also tested for liquid splash. But we also add in a couple others here. The NFPA 1992 suits are only designed for liquid splash. They don't provide any vapor protection, so they come on in here as well. But we also have the class four suits that are particulate that come in here and have a little bit of protection. And the class five, which are new suits that will be coming out, that are kind of like turnout gear, but they don't have the full level of insulation you'd expect from turnout gear, but are gonna be designed specifically for those flammable threats. 
and each of those has different levels of liquid protection. Now, when I look at these in a 1992 suit, I have to remember design considerations here. And these are just my personal opinion. These are not part of the NFPA process. It's just there are multiple different designs that you see out there. And this is how I divide mine out. I always look at the operation and say, if I'm going to have a liquid splash below the knee, I can wear a coverall design. Okay, a two-piece component might be easy. This could be something as simple as sulfuric acid spilt on the highway. Okay, if I think I might have liquid splash, um, but it might come up towards the waist area, but stay below, then I can use one with an elastic seam. Okay, if I'm expecting liquid splash above the waist, I really need to be in something that's either elastomeric or fully encapsulating. My preference is generally to rear entry fully encapsulated because of things like sulfuric acid. If I use that front entry and I go to pick something up, I always tend to put it against my body. And in that case, something like sulfuric acid would find its way around that cover and in through the zipper. Very rarely do you put something up against your back for any length of time that is chemical laden, so you have a less chance of getting exposed that way. Now, this brings us to chem tape. 1992 suits and NFPA 1999 suits, often because they're not tested as ensembles, people often use chem tape or another variant of chemical tape to create the glove to suit and boot to suit interfaces, okay? And those are okay. They're perfectly fine ways to do that. When I'm doing a glove to suit interface, I like to just take a piece of PVC pipe, cut it above the size of the, the person on my team with the biggest knuckles, and then uh, go ahead and tape it right to that PVC pipe. So when I'm taking the suit off, the gloves actually come off with the suit. You can buy cones like that from all the manufacturers or you can make your own. The boot to suit interface, I always try to minimize that chemical splash going into the boot. So I kind of pull up and tape over the boot. Um, if I'm using it on the zipper flaps, that can be problematic only because a lot of the materials are not as strong as the adhesive is. So when you get to some of these lower end suits, you have to be careful not to rip the suit. So if you're using it over the flaps, that's generally going to be useful for something where you're going to cut yourself out of the suit. So a lot of people do a T cut across the shoulders on the back and then cut from the top of the head all the way down that one leg. If you're doing that to get out of the suit, perfectly fine to chem tape over flaps. Now, when do you not use it? You should never use any type of tape, regardless of what kind, on the mask to suit interface. There's a lot of reasons behind this. The first being that the adhesive is very strong. So if for some reason the suit gets snagged on something, the last thing you want to happen is for your mask to pull away from your face. This is critical because your mask is the last thing of protection. We can decon a skin exposure, but we cannot really decon a lung exposure. We also have to remember that the adhesive will leave residue on your mask that can negatively impact uh, your visibility. In addition, you don't want to have anything that's covering up anywhere of your line of sight. Remember that all adhesives are flammable. It's not specific to those in chem tapes or those types of things. They're all flammable, and you really don't want them near the operator's face. And then finally, remember that your respirator was certified without the use of chem tape and because you're now using taping on it, you can negatively impact the respirator fit and protection factor. Therefore, you can be, um, it can be looked at as out of compliance with its certification. So the way I look at it is if you're applying chem tape to a suit, you need to ask yourself if you're trying to increase the protection the suit provides. If that answer is yes, then you probably chose the wrong suit. If the answer is no, you're just trying to increase comfort, then go for it. For example, for increasing comfort, I don't know about all of you, but when I'm wearing a, a, sock with a, a suit with an integrated booty, I actually like to pull that booty up, get it comfortable on my foot, and then I actually tape around the arch of my foot. And that just allows me to get the suit to not keep moving back and forth. And then I pull it up tight just below my knee and tape it there. And then I fold over the excess material. And that allows me to have a good feel of my foot versus having my feet always in problems with all that extra material taped in around it. So that's, again, just a personal preference there. Now, 
When we do particle inward leakage, this is a DOD test that we modified. And what we do here is same type of thing like we did in the mist chamber. We put the operators in the ensembles to be tested. They perform exercises for 30 minutes, everything from squats to twists to everything, trying to get every seam and interface to be challenged. And then if one particle makes it through, we can see it under on the black suit under a UV light, then you fail. And what we're trying to do here is ensure that no particles can get through. We use a two micron size particle. So for those of you who are dealing with uh, fentanyl and carfentanyl, that's about the standard size you would see with those types of materials. And this is a fluorescent particle, just similar to something like Glodger. Now, when we look at particulate protection, the class four um, is providing that particulate protection, but you'd also get that with all of your ones that are certified for vapor protection. Again, class four and your class three, these are breathable types of ensembles, whereas class two and above are all things that are non-breathable. And oh, and then I have a slide for that. Didn't even think about it. But impact of the clothing material, the reason we put those class three and class four suits in ensembles as having breathable materials is because the work type that you would choose those suits for tends to be longer in duration. So these are suits that you would wear for decon. You might wear for investigative purposes. You might wear outside perimeters where you're doing uh, evacuations where the level of threat is low enough that you can wear an APR or PAPR, but high enough that you don't want to go with no skin protection. When we look at heat stress, this is one of the things that comes up a lot as well. And we have to remember that within about 15 minutes, everybody reaches an elevated core temperature inside those fully encapsulated uh, suits that are not breathable. And what happens is if you are in, let's say, Miami, you may reach that 15-minute uh, time profile, but you may reach it in five minutes. Whereas in Alaska in the winter, you may reach it in 15 minutes, but you're going to reach it because it's all about the microclimate gaining within the suit. So what happens is your body continues to sweat as you perform work. You're going to reach a period within the suit where you can no longer sweat because the humidity inside the suit exceeds that at the skin level, which means you cannot sweat, which is 80% of your body's ability to cool itself. So what's happening now is you're continuing to work, but your body is no longer cooling itself. And so you're going to keep going and adding more and more uh, thermal load, thermal burden. Now, a lot of people like to wear cooling suits with that. You have to be really careful here because in a lot of these cooling suits, they cool for a period of time and then their availability to provide cooling stops. And then if you're still in the suit, you continue to increase your workload because of the weight of the materials. And that can be extremely problematic. And what we have here is a lot of these ice-based ones, they're great to use as a pre-cooling and as a post-cooling, but not necessarily suitable for wearing with a garment that is non-breathable. Finally, I want to get into a couple other hazards, things like physical hazard resistance. And this is where we're talking about durability and making sure that we have ensembles that meet the type of areas we work in. We're getting called there for a reason. That reason is something out of the ordinary has occurred, whether it be a pipe that has burst, a munition that has dropped, anything that's there, but something has happened. And that something usually requires us to go into an area where there's physical hazards. So we want to make sure that we don't have problems with abrasion of the suit, flexing of it, or fatigue of the material after repetitive use. The other things we want to remember is about flame resistance testing. And so when we start talking about flames, when we talk about flame resistance, it's about making sure that the suit material itself does not add to your burn injury. So it's not about does it protect you from a burn. It's about making sure that the burn you would have received without the suit material is not going to be worse because you're wearing the suit material. So we look for materials that shrink away from the flame or ones that melt and drip into the flame or ones that actually continue the burning of the flame. 
And these are three different types of materials that would automatically be not allowed because they would add to your burn injury. So that's the first level of test we do for flame resistance is just a material test to say, is this material going to uh, be a problem? And then, of course, we have our flash fire testing. And in this case, we're setting the thing on fire. Okay, we're coming at every direction with flames. And if you see this suit in here, this is actually the Kapler Frontline 500. It's a really nice NFPA 1991 fully encapsulated flash protection suit. And what you see here is this suit before, well, during, and after it has been through an eight second flash fire, meaning fire from all the way around. You can see it doesn't look pretty, but what I can tell you is you can still find your way out of an area and that suit will still be able to pass its pressure test and you're still going to be able to get out of that environment. Now, will you have um, probably other materials now inside your suit if you were in a flash fire? Yeah, I don't think we're reusing that suit. But it's about making sure that the suit allows you to still find your way to safety. And that's what flash fire is about. It's not about protecting you from burn injury. It's about keeping you alive long enough to get out of the situation. With that, I'm actually going to stop and open it up for questions because hopefully there's a lot on there. But I have included my email address, which is just Christina at hazard3.com, and two of our websites. One is our Rethink Level A website. If you go on there, you'll see that we have uh, a DOD sponsored multi hour course just on personal protective equipment and all the different characteristics. Tiswig funded that, and that's there from Resonate Learning for you to be able to go and take. Um, there's also different videos of different webinars we've done on each of the different topics of interest, as well as um, just our regular company website. So with that, Steve, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Uh, Christine, that's awesome. And we do have, we got about uh, five minutes left and we do have a couple questions. Um, so Rob Horgan asks, uh, you mentioned the standard for selection care and maintenance. He was just curious if you could give that reference again. Oh, that's NFPA 1891. And it won't be released uh, until October, November of this year. And it's been a labor of love for about 30 years now, Rob. So it's finally coming out. <laughs> Super. Thanks, Christina. So one of the things that was the bane of my existence when I uh, ran Seaburf and maintained the warehouse bar PPE was shelf life. Um, <laughs> do you have any thoughts? <laughs> I see I hear from your chuckle. You're going to have some. Um, that's striking that balance. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Okay. So one of the things, there, there always was this whole mythical creation around shelf life. And the unfortunate part is there are some vendors who chose not to give a shelf life saying, hey, they're good forever as long as you test it. There's others that we give. We had some at one point, they're given a shelf life of like six months. I'm like, well, that doesn't work because we don't even have it at DOD by then. Okay. Now, what we are requiring now for the NFPA process is that every manufacturer must give you a shelf life. And then they also give you the storage requirements to meet that shelf life and how, how they determined it. So many manufacturers, thankfully, over many years have now been able to store these types of materials in different environments and see what they are and how they do. There's other um, manufacturers who have had to, because they're newer materials, they've had to do accelerated aging testing on them. And those are all perfectly suitable ways to determine shelf life. And we have to remember that the shelf life is based upon the least common denominator. A lot of time that's gonna be the rubber materials that may get dry rot. And so it's really about how you store them and making sure that you store them according to manufacturer's directions to get the longest longevity. I know from a DOD perspective, we're not great about following manufacturer's directions on storage. You know, when the manufacturer says to store in a um, environment that is climate controlled, that does not mean a Conex container in the desert. 
and we've been down that road. Thankfully, it did not provide us with any problems, but these are the types of things you have to look at. And really, every one of our manufacturers that participates in this whole process, give them a call and ask them, what are the things we should and shouldn't do? Because they are there to help you and they do a fantastic job. Yeah, that's a, I think that's what we always do with all of Phil's read the directions, right? <laughs> so, um, Doc, Doc Eric, Dr. Eric Schwartz, who is the senior scientist yeah. at hey, Eric. has a question for you. Um, he's curious about um, the, 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 the daunting SCBA slash PAPR combination mask. Do you have any information or thoughts on when that's going to come out? So that's the 1987 standard, and that one is being performed, being developed right now. And I think it was just out for public comment. And so what he's talking about is the combination unit respirator mask uh, standard. So if you're looking at the hazmat CBRN PPE standards, we actually have a couple of different ones. There's the 1990 series of standards, which cover chemical protective clothing. Then there's also the respiratory protection standards. 1981 is the SCBA standard for firefighting applications. 1986 is the SCBA standard for hazmat, CBRN, and other technical and tactical objectives. There's going to be a 1987 coming out, which is a combination unit respirator. Now, we have to remember that today there is no combination unit certification process for NIOSH, who actually is the authority over all of our respiratory protection. However, it's nice to know that NIOSH has been leading the effort for this combination respirator standard. And so it's all working hand in hand. Right now, what they're focusing on is certifying at each of the configurations, so as an air purifying respirator, as a powered air purifying respirator, and as an SCBA, and then we're focusing the standard on those switching mechanisms to make sure that as the switching mechanism occurs, you don't have any problems. But I think, I don't know when it comes out, but I think it might be a 2023 standard, which would mean it would come out in late fall of 2022. But I can check on that, Eric, and send that one to you, Doc Schwartz. So we had two questions, Dr. Baxter, about um, kind of uh, biologicals, uh, COVID-19 pandemic lessons learned, and then some students asked a question about uh, this type of PPE being worn in a COVID Ebola environment. I'm just going to make it more generic. I know from our discussions you have thoughts on this, so I'll just go ahead and let you speak to that, and I think that'll be all the time we have. Well, let's separate the two right quick. COVID and Ebola, very different threats. If it is Ebola, okay, which is a blood-borne virus, which can be very, very traumatic, then that is what the class four design was for. So when we deal with something like Ebola, it's all about that class four design. When we deal with something like uh, COVID, it is not a thermal threat in any way. OK, it is something that we can deal with pretty easily. What we're looking for for COVID is materials that protect your undergarments to make sure that you don't re-aerosolize. And so in this case, there's a lot of different options. Reality is when I'm dealing with something like Ebola, it is the only time that I take a chemical protective clothing design and the CBRN standards and apply it. And that's all for the viral hemorrhagic fevers. So class four, 1994. When I'm dealing with other biological threats, I actually revert down to the NFPA 1999 standard, which is for emergency medical services and very much focuses on blood-borne pathogens. And what I'm looking at there is using something like, um, I think the Kapler makes a ProVent 10,000, which is, I think it's an NFPA 1999 single use ensemble. And so when I like the NFPA 1999 multi-use and single use ensembles for all of the other biological threats. So take a look at those ones. Is that what you're looking for, Steve? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Christina. And I, I think we are out of time, but I, I actually got one from Irene Richardson that just came in that I think is actually a pretty good one. And even here in the U.S., we, we, we struggle with this at times. She goes, she's curious about comparison charts. And she mentions in particular discussing comparison of OSHA levels with European ensembles. But I know that, that, that you have a lot of experience in this, so I think we can go ahead and take that one on. So we have developed a lot of charts trying to compare the OSHA and EPA levels to the NFPA levels and then trying to pull in their European standards. And the problem that we have with the European standards is, is pretty much everything passes, it's to what level it passes. And then you might have mixing and matching of physical properties meet one level and chemical protection meets another level. So we can't do an exact comparison. There's no way to do that with the European standards, but we are working very closely with the ISO, International Standards Organization Committee. I sit on that one as well for the CBRN PPE standard and trying to develop a CBRN PPE standard that we could make comparable versus their hazmat, which are uh, industrial standards. They don't, they're very separate over there. And so, yeah, Irene, I'll send you what I've got, um, but I don't have something that's a very specific line by line. Yeah, super. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Baxter. So with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up since we're just slightly over time. But, but thanks to everybody for joining us today. And as mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, the slides from recording this presentation are going to be available for download at the HDI website, www.hdiac.org. And there's been some information on the left-hand side that, that has discussed that. If you're interested in learning more about this or getting involved as a subject matter expert or presenter or just expanding your presence in the user community, please feel free to reach out directly using all that contact information that's popping up on the left-hand side of your screen. In addition to these monthly webinars, HDAC also offers podcasts, biweekly email, and digest. We're anticipating the release of a podcast that I recently did with the 87th Commandant of the Marine Corps that should be a good one. Um, so there's lots of good information out there. And then, as you saw, Dr. Baxter threw up her information there. She is always happy to help. Um, again, as I said, she's the CEO of Hazard 3. Uh, a lot of, lot of good information there, a lot of uh, good training resources there, and always a resource for you. I encourage you to contact uh, you, or, excuse me, contact her because uh, she is always willing to support you and your organization. So again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christina. Best regards to everyone, and I hope you stay well. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Stay safe.